I think that everyone appreciates a good t-shirt. They're, they're comfortable, they're casual, they're, and you know, you just, you throw on a t-shirt and you relax. And the truth is there are days when a t-shirt just really says it best. You know, you've seen all kinds of t-shirts. And, and I, I just thought about some of my favorites. There, there's one I like to wear on the days when I love you, but I just don't want to deal with you, okay? <laughs> and this is a shirt that really communicates that in a nice way. <laughs> there are days, many days, I promise you, in ministry when I choose to wear this shirt, and you probably do as well for various reasons, <laughs> Right? And there's days when you have this struggle and stress and strain of life, when you just, you get off the nutrition plan, you skip the gym, you do, fitness isn't for you. Well, fitness is for you. And so you wear this t-shirt. And then the day after that, you have to put on a different t-shirt because you fit all those tacos in. And then you realize, We've got a problem here. I once tried this t-shirt on at home because this next one, because I felt like, well, you know, it's time for Kelly to know who's boss around here. It didn't work. But you know, this is, this is a religious conference. It's a, it's a spiritual messianic conference. So I want to bring it around into something more serious, more theological. One of my favorite religious t-shirts, which really summarizes the best, the Jewish experience as I see it. And you've probably seen the t-shirt before. It's, it's a summary of the Jewish experience over thousands of years. It's incredibly accurate today as we celebrate the holiday of Purim. This is it. Now listen, in preparation for this lecture, I realized that my last two Malchut lectures opened with food-centric topics. <laughs> and so as much as I want to talk to you about delicious, greasy, fried pancakes and sufkan yot for Hanukkah, or I don't know, Homentashen, or the dairy extravaganza of Shavuot with blintzes and, and ice cream and all these, or brisket at Passover. I mean, notice I did not say matzah. <laughs> if you think matzah is a delicacy, talk to me when you've eaten it for 50 years. We can clear that, we can clear that mistake up. But listen, all that I have to skip the Jewish cuisine review. And really what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the concept behind the feasting. Why do we feast? Okay? It's not every holiday, but just think about this with me. Purim, Passover, Hanukkah, it fits the bill of the t-shirt. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. I mean, we have a day of remembrance for the destruction of not one, but two temples, temples and exiles. We have a day of remembrance for six million people, Jews killed for being Jews, a million children murdered. And you're thinking right now, wow, what a bummer. This is not what I came to Orlando for. I didn't come to hear this, but... It's important that you're here, and it's important that you hear this. I mean, as much as I love a good funny t-shirt and the snarky Jewish humor that goes behind them, you know, and, and the humor present in that discussion, what that first line says, they tried to kill us, there's nothing funny about that. This holiday called Purim, it's about a crazy guy who got angry because a Jewish guy wouldn't bow down to him and said, I'll kill you and all of your people and got permission from the ruling powers of the government to do it. 
The Torah tells the story of a Pharaoh who was concerned that too many Jews were rising up in his land that they might overpower him. So what did he do? He commanded his people to throw their babies in the river. Can you imagine? And then the same oppressed people later became slaves, subjected subjected to abominable conditions. And even when the Pharaoh, another Pharaoh, had seen God working in the miracles, it still wasn't enough for him to put away his hatred and not pursue them to kill them all. But but my talk isn't really about anti-Semitism, so I'm not going to continue through the recorded, historically confirmed acts that have continued against the Jewish people, from various rulers and empires to people who said they loved Jesus but who felt that Jews were the spawn of Satan. In Spain, in England, in Europe, in Russia, all the way to Israel, to 1948, to 1967, to 1973, to the Intifada, to the Second Intifada, to the Lebanon Wars, to the Gaza Wars of the 2000s, and yes, to October 7th, 2023. They tried to kill us. Now I wanna be clear, I am in no way suggesting that Jewish people are the only ones who have suffered brutality. Human beings can be despicable toward one. Indeed, they are currently abominable toward one another sometimes. And I don't have time enough to scratch the surface of the crimes against humanity that have occurred. African slave trade, North and South America indigenous peoples, Armenia, Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, the Yazidi, the Uyghurs. But my friends, though I am no history expert, The scale and scope, the duration and intensity of the Jewish experience is unique. A calendar of holidays, which includes many, too many remembrances that they tried to kill us. A calendar that tells a unique story. Judaism's unique historical narrative of repeated existential threats, the resilience and the inverse adversity of those, to stand through those as a distinct experience. And so, yes, you know what? In some way, we celebrate it. We, we make a T-shirt. But the persistence of Jewish hatred and its impact on Jewish life and identity cannot be understated. It influences everything from Jewish theology and philosophy and ethics to community organizations, education, the very sense of what it means to be Jewish is influenced by this. The awareness of being part of a continuum of history that includes profound suffering and remarkable survival. That shapes the Jewish people to some degree, a large degree. And it's fair though to then ask a question. Why? Why this history? Why this experience? And there are a number of horrendous responses that you can hear pretty quickly. The first one and most obvious to so many people is, well, it killed Jesus. What do you expect? Which is a theological absurdity when you read the gospels. But the truth is that started way before Jesus. It probably has, definitely has gotten worse after. But there's another answer. Sometimes you'll hear, well, it was prophesied. Now, There's at least a a shred of biblical validity to this one in the sense that we know there were curses. We know that there were things. There's an exile, right? It's reasonable to suggest that with God, there is a consequence for disobedience. But even with that acknowledged, I struggle with the level 
of suffering and enduring hatred that is attached to the Jewish people. I mean, did God not like us that much? You're my chosen people, chosen to suffer for millennia in the most atrocious and inexplicably hateful ways. Brings to mind Tevye's great comment, right? Chosen people, I know. Every once in a while, couldn't you choose someone else? But the thing is, it leads leads to an even deeper question that's tied to our t-shirt second line, we won. How can we possibly suggest that? How can we possibly say that with all the loss, the innocent lives that have been taken, that in any way we've won, we've established that the first line, they tried to kill us, that's not funny, but is we won even remotely true? Is that even a possibility? How can we say this is a victory? Well, here's the thing. If you peel back the layers just a bit and you put a little dash of trust into the divine plan, I can show you in a way that Judaism recognized, in a way that many outside of Judaism have recognized. Mark Twain was not always a friend to the Jews. He had some errant things he said, but he also had this to say in Harper's Weekly at the end of the 19th century. I just want to read it to you. You can just listen. Stay awake. I know it's late. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous, dim puff of stardust in the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of. But he is heard of, has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people. And his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and learning are way out of the proportion of the weakness of his numbers. He's made a marvelous fight in the world, in all ages, and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian, they rose, they filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded the dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone. And other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight now, or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. Mark Twain said, all things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? That's quite an assessment, Mark. Samuel is his real name. The Haggadah offers an answer and points us to how we might say we've won. On Passover, we read this. In each and every generation, someone arises against us to destroy us, but the Holy One, blessed is he, rescues us from their hands. That statement from a relatively ancient text, which was true in the days it was written, is still True, and brings to mind a thought that undergirds the hearts and minds of Jewish people then and now. When we read those words from the Haggadah, we recall the lessons of the festivals. Certainly, we can reflect on current tribulations. But we are here because we survived the earlier persecutions. Just as we survived those, we will survive these because through the fire we are stronger. 
On that Seder plate, you find much symbolism. One of those things is the egg, the hard-boiled egg. And among all the the different symbolisms there, Jewish tradition compares the hard-boiled egg to the Jewish people as a whole. The longer it boils, the harder it gets. The egg is present at meals of mourning, and celebration, somber and celebratory, the egg embodies the resilience required to maintain identity, to, re- to maintain identity. How have we won, you ask? Persecution, loss, tragedy? It made us stronger, not weaker. And in answer to Mark Twain's question, what is the secret of the Jews' immortality? It is no secret. It is deep-seated internal faith that the words of Paul are true. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, though in our case, not easy to bear. The road is indeed hard. We are not innocent completely. Chosen carries with it a responsibility. Shine the light, do the teaching, lead by example, do the right things. And we've not always shown in that way. But we have and continue to have moments of shining the light. But you see, even in the dark moments, we know individually, collectively, These, they tried to kill us experiences, not just the festivals, but the uniquely, unique experience of the Jewish people. We won, you wanna know why? Because God is with us. In each and every generation, someone arises against us to destroy us, but the Holy One, blessed is he, rescues us from their hands. But you see, it's more than a rescue, it's an elevation. It's an improvement. These things make us stronger. And while logically we might have said, chosen, who needs a God like this? And abandoned it, the trust and the hope. Instead, we double down on it. We double down on him because we believe it. And there must be some purpose that points to something glorious down the road. I can tell you from experience, at times, that is hard to see. It's Purim. Well, it's Shushan Purim now, but close enough. The illustration works. We dress up in the spirit of Esther, fantastic costumes, but we hide our true identity on Purim, knowing, of course, that God is working behind the scenes, and we we put on a mask, right? That's a thing. And I can tell you just to be personal for a minute, there are times in my life, my past especially, when I really wanted to hide my Judaism and put on a mask. My dad was very young when I was born. He was a med student. We, 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 were, we never got to spend a lot of time together then, but we signed up for something called Indian Guides back in the 70s or 80s. It was like the Cub Scouts but not the Cub Scouts. But we went camping, and, and I, we had been sent off to the tent to go to bed, and the dads gathered around, all, most of them older than my dad, gathered around the campfire to hang out and talk, and the conversation went on, and then the conversation turned to minorities and Jews. There's my 20-something-year-old dad around all these older men. You just keep your mouth shut. Next morning we packed up. We never went back to anything from Indian guides. I never really knew exactly what happened, but I overheard my parents talking about it. And for the first time in my life, I sort of knew I'm different and not necessarily in a good way. And you know, Growing up, I I felt that expressed in many ways. Sometimes out of ignorance, simple Jewish jokes, I had a really good friend. He was a friend, 
And it seemed like every time I was trying to talk to or impress some cute girl, he'd come up and say, hey, Damien, why'd, why'd the Jews spend 40 years in the desert? Somebody dropped a quarter. <laughs> hey, that's funny, man. It's not funny, but you just keep your mouth shut. And in the South, I don't know, we got a diverse audience here, but in the South, what you found out is that you didn't get a good deal, you Jewed someone down. And I heard it all the time. And you just keep your mouth shut, sort of. And it was probably out of ignorance, it still is. But you know what, it wasn't always out of ignorance. The jokes were not always out of ignorance. They were from a place of hatred. To my younger brother who was six or seven years old, hey Jordan, what's the difference between a Jew and an apple pie? An apple pie doesn't scream when you put it in the oven. Ha, ha, ha. And there were so many other words that were said in ignorance or hate, and they didn't even have to be directed toward you, but, but to your people as a whole, which makes you turn away and become inward. And you know what? To some degree, I'm certain that my decision when I became a believer, a disciple, to try to turn my back on Judaism was because, oh my goodness, finally I can be like everybody else. I can take the mask off. I don't have to, I don't have to, to be different. And so I walked away from it. I don't have to feel nervous. But you see, deep down, deep down, I remembered, thanks to those who spoke good and kind words about who I was to me, I remembered the festivals. I remembered the lessons. I remembered the symbolism and the saving power and the words of the Haggadah and the idea that, yeah, they tried to kill us, but here we are, we won, here we are. And I came back, and I've shared this story with you before, I came back and I, I took the mask off and I came back to Judaism and I found out, oh my goodness, these festivals are actually tied to this Jesus guy who's actually one of us, wow. <laughs> and that was an incredible story and realization you know, the festivals look back, but they also look forward. There's this messianic hope and goodness. And that was a story. But something even more remarkable happened. In this crazy, messy, antic, messianic thing. In Messiah, I was now surrounded by, my family was supported by brothers and sisters from the nations, and it makes me want to cry. Which was something new and something different and almost hard to believe. People who weren't Jewish, but in Messiah, who truly loved the Jewish people and participated alongside and didn't just stand with Israel, they stood with us, the Jewish people. These disciples of Yeshua, these Gentiles who legitimately loved and cared, who changed the narrative that I had always known. And what I came to see is, yes, God is with the Jewish people. But so are you. And I could see that our story, the Jewish one, in Messiah had become in such a powerful way our story. Our story, and it is a, it, it, it's a mysterious one. That's the word Paul likes to use when he talks about the Gentiles coming into this thing, mysterion. The one, you know, it's, it's, it's no wonder that having lived with the idea that they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat, that I would be kind of confused by this, that it would be a little bit mysterious. 
but our story, the incredible story of the Jews and the Gentiles, one in Messiah, the one that's being told in this room tonight, the one that is being told at this event and beyond is the story that God has been telling for a long, long time. The revelation, Paul says, of the mysterion that was kept secret for long ages but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. That our story, the Jewish one, becomes our story. Isaiah, Micah, Amos, Zechariah, they told that story. Yeshua told that story about the nations coming to dinner with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Cornelius, Peter, Paul, they told that story that we're not alone, we don't have to be alone. And you, we're not in the kingdom. This is not perfection. But you are a prophetic picture of what they saw, a taste of the first fruits. Amen. Our story is that taste. But you know, it adds a twist to the T-shirt. They tried to kill us October 7th. Sadly, to a small degree, they succeeded. And we still mourn and we still hurt and we're still in agony for the lost family and friends and so many and the hostages. But they did not kill us. As a matter of fact, they made us stronger. Yeah. Now, one thing is certain on that day, we certainly found out and in the aftermath who the Jewish people can rely on. You know, we, you probably read and heard and saw the same things I did, but what I just said about our story, I'm willing to bet that unlike many people in the world, you probably felt it more. You probably felt the same thing I did, not just about the massacre, which is impossible to describe. Even more than that, what you felt was the response of the world And even those responses of those who purportedly love Jesus. Which caused you, if you were like me, to feel some despair or disgust or confusion. The feeling of, I can't believe it's happening again. As anti-Jewish spirals into anti-Semitic all over the world. And I'm sure you felt that. And I'm sure it hurt. And you know what? That's good. That's good. It needs to be part of your story that some part of you can relate to the they tried to kill us thing. Many don't feel anything like those who sat on the shore and watched them throw Hebrew babies in the Nile River. Other people feel a lot. You know what it is? Hatred and satisfaction that the Jews got hurt or might finally get what's coming to them. Friends, the t-shirt is still real. They tried to kill us. And when you feel the us the way I think you probably feel the us, that's good. But I want to tell you something. There is a cost. To align yourself with the Jewish people, the Messiah as the king of the Jews, the Jewish story and what is to come, the, the prophecies, the wars, the potential persecutions, being ostracized, judged, hated, and who knows what else. You say, man, is this, couldn't there be an easier way? I can tell you from history, there's not. This is the way. But together, in our story, we will not be timid. We will not back up. We will not be afraid. We will not be quiet. We will not hide behind any mask because the truth of it is we are stronger together. And it brings to mind the great words of Yeshua. 
I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have what? Tribulation and trouble and surus. But take heart, I've overcome the world. That is the Jewish story. And again in Messiah Yeshua, those who were far off have come near. That is our story. Because the hope and the future that has sustained the Jewish people for millennia is alive and well. It calls for a new t-shirt. Slight twist, same idea. They tried to kill us. He wins, let's feast. Where there will be no death, the Lord will be victorious. And I said I wasn't gonna say anything about food, but I knew I could get it in there. Because the greatest feast is yet to come on the mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of marrow, of more wine. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples that is spread over all the nations. And that veil has been removed from you already. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now that's a festival. So this is the Malchut Summit. It means kingdom. And this is a big, beautiful picture of part of our story. That's the kingdom. That's where all of this points. It really does. The Jewish story, the persecutions, the trials, the tragedies, the heartbreaks, yes, every bit of it. But also God's faithfulness revealed in the festivals and the purpose of our struggle and the strengthening and the calling and the mission, they all point to the malchut, the kingdom. That's where we're going. That's where it points for us. This malchut, this moment, may be a defining moment in our story. As the events happening in the world cement us even closer together as disciples, one in Messiah. Zechariah 8.23, thus says the Lord of hosts in those days, 10 men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you, my friends. I am so thankful that there are so many more than 10 in this room tonight. Thank you for understanding the story and our story. You who have embraced it, you who have come to strengthen your faith, your calling and your willingness to act, welcome to Malchut. It's a foretaste of the kingdom. There is no better place to be as we celebrate the incredible story that's being written in our times and we await the promises of the future we long for. I am praying that the next few days, couple days, speak so deeply into your hearts. And that the Lord will place these words in your heart. The words that have guarded and kept the Jewish people even as we entered into the land that is ours. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And together we go, my friends. Thank you.